want to for here? Hi, welcome to Intuition, whereby we take a look at behind the scenes of academia at UBC. Hey folks, my name's Flint, and I'm a recent graduate from the International Relations Program. I'm really excited to be one of your new hosts. And I'm Lila, and I'll be graduating in history this summer here at UBC too. Today we're asking a really simple question, what's wrong with getting an arts degree? So before we get started, let's just sort of define what we mean by the word arts. So a lot of people hear the term arts and they think things like painting and drawing, but here at the podcast, what we're talking about is uh, the liberal arts, so things that fall under the umbrella of the Faculty of Arts here at UBC. So this includes things like the social sciences, like political science, sociology, economics. And they also include subjects under the humanities, such as English, history, philosophy, classics, and area and period studies. As someone who has studied history for the past four years, I've had a lot of people asking me, what can you do with a history degree and what kind of jobs can you get after? Um, some people, you know, have this specific idea that the only type of job that you can get is something less complex and more menial, like, you know, working as an administrative assistant mm-hmm. or for some people, you know, working as a barista, like that's the common, you know tagline like, oh, history majors working as a barista. Um, And as someone who is graduating or approaching graduation right now, um, I do have, I have some fears and anxiety about what I'm going to do after. Um, So in this episode, we'll be discussing, um, you know, what are the challenges of getting a liberal arts degree and how can, you know, students like Flynn and myself overcome this fear, anxiety and discomfort. And I think all of us can really sort of relate to this in the faculty of arts role, at least a good majority of us, because you know, a lot of people approach you with this questions of not just like what you're going to do with your degree, but like, was this a good investment? Mm-hmm. And, you know, there's there's a lot of overlooking of sort of the practical skills uh, mm-hmm. rather than the specific skills that you get from an arts degree. Um, and it's important to note that this isn't just in our imaginations. Uh, like later, we'll actually talk to a few uh, art students on campus and see how they feel about it. But there's actual uh, policy implications of this sort of perception that the value of the arts degree has declined. So, you know, for example, over the past 20 years, there's been a jump uh, in vocational majors from 15 percent to 32 percent. And almost all of that jumps come from the arts faculties across North America. Um, Another example is that uh, Western University in Canada, they recently had a proposed budget cut to the arts and humanities program of 20 percent. And there was a huge article with outrage of this. And a lot of this isn't sort of just the top Mm -hmm. looking down and saying this is worthless. A lot of this is coming from a lack of demand for arts degrees. Mm -hmm. Just there's a lot of students who just think that there's no money in it, Mm -hmm. which is why I'm sure everybody can kind of relate in the faculty of arts. Almost every one of your friends or every other one of your friends wants to go to law school. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's not because we're all obsessed with law. It's because that's (laughs) that's where the money is, to be frank. Yeah. And I think your example about law school, Flynn, just shows that it's not that nobody wants to pursue an arts degree, but for some people, it's sort of a luxury because they see you going into university for four years and learning something that is not um, concrete and doesn't really lead to a you know hard skill that they will apply in the workplace. Um, you know, and this is unlike engineering or business degree, whereby you know for most en- engineering students, you know high chances mm-hmm. are they would uh, take on engineering jobs. And similar yeah. for students in the business school, you know, coming in taking like a marketing or a business development degree, high chances are they could apply for a job with that you know uh, job title and they, they will get it. So for some people going to you know uh, going to an arts program is just a luxury that they can't afford because, you know, they can't afford four years of not learning anything um, super important and then spend another couple of years post-graduation figuring out what they want to do, where they want to work. Yeah, and that's, you know, pretty personally relevant to, to me, for example. Like, uh, I know that I ended up in the arts program anyway, but I actually wanted to be an audio technician and I wanted to go to uh, an actual, like, real fine art school where mm-hmm. I was going to learn how to record music. And uh, my parents and I, that was a really big point of contention for us because, you know, they're turning to me and they're saying, Flint, you know, you think that you're going to be the next Garth Richardson or one of these big time producers, mm-hmm. but that's like one in a million. Yeah. Like the most that you're probably going to have is making, you know, 20 to 30 grand a year. And most employers, they like they like seeing that name UBC on it, regardless of what you study. And yeah. that's that's how I ended up here. So what we're going to do now is basically just introduce the rest of how this podcast is going to go down. And for the rest of the time that you're going to be with us, we're basically going to be conducting interviews with a variety of different people. And the first couple are going to be with students on campus just to kind of gauge how, you know, the everyday student who's not a part of the web team feels about uh, this trope that arts degrees are declining in value. And then after that, we're actually going to have an interview with an arts prof on campus named uh, Professor Bradley Miller. Uh, 
And he has a lot of interesting insights that he's going to share with us. And uh, after our conversation with him, which went on for like an hour and a half, we ended up having to cut down quite a bit. So we're only going to really be able to show you the highlights. And after that, Lyle and I are going to discuss basically some of our reflections and what he had to say. So the first student we interviewed had a pretty anxious feeling of her arts degree. Okay, so can you tell me your year and major? I'm in my fourth year. I'm going actually into my fifth year, and I double major in political science and anthropology. Okay, so you're in the Faculty of Arts. Yes, I am. Okay, and uh, do you think there's anything wrong with getting an arts degree? I mean, I don't know if you can say wrong exactly, but I've had a lot of anxiety uh, by the end of my fourth year about having an undergraduate degree in arts and also in considering what I'm going to do for my master's and if I'm going to continue uh, with arts. Okay, so do you feel as if like maybe it's not a good investment or do you think there's any sort of other value to getting an arts degree? Well, I worry about the practical value of having an arts degree. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when you're in your fourth year, it becomes very real that you have to do something with this degree in your life. And I think it's quite easy to see that, you know, things like the hard sciences have a lot of value, practical value, in the world and in innovation and are a lot more easy to, they're a lot more quantifiable. And I think that's difficult with a lot of subjects in art. And that's one of the things I worry about with anthropology and political science. They're not exactly efficient degrees or disciplines or subjects. So the student that we spoke to had some very powerful comments and remarks about the sense of anxiety that a lot of students on campus are facing, particularly arts graduates. However, we also interviewed another person who is an arts graduate, and he mentioned that um, having an arts degree isn't really limiting, but in fact, it opens up a lot of avenues for students during their post-graduation careers. Okay, and uh, can I just ask you uh, again, what, what did you major in when you were in university? So I majored uh, in English language mm -hmm. and opera performance, which is music, so. Nice, okay. Yeah. And uh, do you think that there's anything wrong with getting an arts degree? Ooh, uh, tough question. I don't think there's anything wrong with mm -hmm. getting an arts degree. I think there's a lot of valuable things that you learn uh, in the arts. Mm -hmm. It's perfect for people who want to develop a variety of skills, mm -hmm. um, look at things at an interdisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. um, I think if anything, what's wrong sometimes is when people box themselves like mm -hmm. within what their degree is, yeah. whether it's arts or another degree. And I think the most important thing is that um, throughout your degree, you're able to uh, reflect and be cognizant of the things that you're learning in the process and be able to share that story later on, mm -hmm. uh, which would be crucial for you to um, either finding employment mm -hmm. or seeing yourself um, as a, you know, uh, or seeing yourself in some sort of career that you'd like to be in. So. so you see like having like an open mind as more important to finding careers than what your specific major is? Yes, for sure. And finding and also like complementing potentially like while you're in school, complementing uh, what you're learning in the classroom by your experiences outside. So whether it's volunteer mm -hmm. experience or um, or it's a paid uh, experience. So, uh, yeah, I think at the end of the day, like I feel like an undergraduate degree is just um, it's just part of the growing up process, but it's not necessarily what it's not limiting you as to what you're going to be or what you want to be. So. The two art students that we spoke to had some insightful ideas about what it means to take on an arts degree, but we also wanted to find out what the professors in arts felt about what they said. To find out, we spoke to Professor Bradley Miller, who is a professor and an undergraduate chair in the Department of History. So one of the first things we did when we sat down with Professor Miller is we actually asked him if he was familiar with this trope that arts degrees are either declining in value or that they're useless. And he actually had a pretty interesting st uh, story to share with us about his own undergraduate experience. And just take a listen to it now. I hear the same things from students now about jobs and mm -hmm. economic insecurity and needing to go on to something that I heard when I started university pretty well exactly 20 years ago. Yeah. Like my first night on campus, <laughs> the, um, the engineers lined up in front of our residence and sang a song, the lyric of which was, you'll all work for us one day. Oh <laughs> <laughs> and I remember saying things, I remember saying things and hearing other people say things like, well, I'm never going to get a job. I'm never going to make money because yeah. I'm doing English. And um, that's just a burden that I've accepted. Like these, these mm -hmm. concerns have, 
have long been there. Yeah. And I, um, I actually like that they're a part of campus culture. Okay. I like that people, A, feel that there is a consequence to their education, that mm. the choices that they make in these few years at mm. university um, is one that they need to um, think carefully about and constantly mm. monitor because it is going to matter for the rest of their lives. Mm. That's good. Um, I also like that when people make choices – they're challenged. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we yelled back at those engineers that they were embarking in, like, pointless, mind-numbing careers. Mm -hmm. Not that I really think that, but that mm -hmm. that animosity actually led to, you know, a productive refinement because they were forced mm -hmm. to think, um, like, do, do I really like this? Yeah. And I know several people that dropped out of engineering. I know yeah. several people yeah. that dropped out of English. People yeah. switched sides. Um, and that that animosity is a challenge, and that challenge is good. And because this sense of anxiety is so familiar to us, we asked Professor Miller if he has any examples of arts graduates making a meaningful impact on society. We live in a country, and I think in many ways a world, that is run by arts graduates. Yeah. Um, I um, have done a little digging on this in the last couple of days. Um, think nationally. Our prime minister studied literature. Mm -hmm. um, our foreign minister, Christian Freeland, mm -hmm. uh, studied Russian history, Russian That's literature. Crazy. Our um, minister of finance studied poli-sci. Mm -hmm. So did our minister of justice and attorney general, mm -hmm. Jody Wilson-Raybould. Um, I, as I said, I, I like studying the history of law. And our recently retired long-serving and, uh, I got to say, massively influential Chief Justice of Canada, Beverly McLaughlin, mm -hmm. has a BA and an MA in philosophy. Yeah, she's brilliant. Um, I got curious about this, and so I, I wondered about how many of the nine U.S. Supreme Court justices, mm -hmm. members of the most, probably the most influential court in the world, how yeah. many of those nine are arts or social science graduates? Um, it turns out all nine of them. Mm -hmm. Humanities gets all nine of these seats. When you look at finance and business, there are also, um, weirdly, some excellent examples. Yeah. Um, Lloyd Blankfein, the outgoing CEO of Goldman Sachs, long-serving CEO of Goldman Sachs, is a history graduate. Mm -hmm. um, as is the outgoing CEO um, of Amex, Roger, or sorry, uh, Ken Chenault. Mm -hmm. um, he was a CEO of Amex for, I think, 17 years, in mm -hmm. a massively pivotal period in the company's history. There are so many examples of people from these fields innovating in basically all areas of our world, all areas of our economy. Yeah. And so I hear this line about um, these degrees being less valuable. Mm -hmm. And um, it doesn't comport with much of what we know. The best argument uh, on the other side mm -hmm. um, is the dollar argument, and that's that the um, the median salaries mm -hmm. for humanities graduates are lower than the median salaries for engineering and science graduates. Um, but what we also know is that there is so much variability yeah. in salary mm -hmm. um, within each of those fields mm -hmm. um, that um, I get the proposition. Mm -hmm. I just don't think it should be a guiding principle for people. So after we got that response from Professor Miller, we started to ask him about the actual nitty-gritty numbers with regards to the perceived and real decline in arts faculties today. And we also asked him a little bit about uh, the marketization and the sort of corporatization of the university and what he felt and thought about that. That decline and the discussions of that decline mm -hmm. are real and they're powerful in mm -hmm. arts faculties today. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think... Um, it may have taken a long time for a lot of humanities academics mm -hmm. to wake up to it. Mm -hmm. um, the ones I talk to have done so. Mm -hmm. They've all recognized yeah. that um, we need to um, we need to innovate. Mm -hmm. We need to adapt. Mm -hmm. um, um, not really to survive. You know there are sometimes worst case scenarios about departments being cut or departments being combined. Mm -hmm. um, but um, to, th to thrive, to make sure, for example, that um, we can continue to hire people mm -hmm. who are, uh, to replace people who are retired, for example, that we can continue to expand um, in my own department to cover the areas of the globe where we don't currently cover. Mm -hmm. um, and so 
to do that, to acquire those resources to do the humanities research that we all in these departments love doing. We have to show the university that students um, are coming back to us. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's a bunch of different ways that art de arts departments are doing this. Some of it is advertising. Mm -hmm. That is, um, letting more and more people know about the stuff mm -hmm. that we actually do yeah. offer. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, um, in the uh, kind of imagined golden past, we didn't need to do that. Mm -hmm. But um, now we are embarking on an advertising campaign in history, for example, mm -hmm. to showcase the very cool things that we do. Mm -hmm. um, I have um, colleagues developing um, lots of exciting new classes. Uh, a colleague uh, is developing a, a class on the history of Hong Kong, for example, that just yeah. sounds fantastic. Mm -hmm. I, I um, started a class last year on the history of the Canadian Constitution mm -hmm. um, that takes us from the pre-contact period to essentially whatever Charter of Rights case just got handed down that mm -hmm. marks a new milestone in Canadian law. Mm -hmm. um, and part of, that, uh, part of this effort also is to think about ways... Um, where we engage with the present day more. Mm -hmm. I got to say, when, when I'm in class and we get to that period, yeah. after the Charter of Rights, for example, and we start talking about what the Supreme Court has done with the equality rights provision mm -hmm. in the last 15 years, what the Supreme Court has done with your right to security of the person in the mm -hmm. last 10 years alone, mm -hmm. there's a lot of excitement. I see students really excited at what they call... Um, relevance now. And I think departments like mine are starting to capitalize on that, yeah. starting to, to use that to show people the value of what we actually do. Mm -hmm. So again, this, mm -hmm. this strikes me as a place where um, what you might call the market pressures yeah. mm -hmm. of academia aren't inconsistent with um, the the ideals of the liberal arts, the ideas, mm -hmm. the ideals of the humanities, they actually work together really well. Okay, yeah. so you have like sort of I, I don't want to like distort it too much because this has become a dirty word, but um, <laughs> like sort of like a, a market based academia will will basically bear out um, an equilibrium, a better equilibrium, if like you want to use the econ language, mm -hmm. because those pressures will basically pressure innovation, which in turn will be you know to quote Schumpeter the the creative destruction. Yeah. Of various different stuff until you get to a point where you've you've retained you you've recaptured the relevance, which brings it, which draws people in. Yeah, I I, I think the market pressures here have have um, forced people to um, to reach out more, and I think mm -hmm. that's great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I, one of the things I think a lot about is that um, we are in competition in Canada. Those of us who teach and research at universities in Canada are in competition not just with other departments, mm -hmm. but with um, with hospitals mm -hmm. and social services and lots of other things and foreign aid and the military and lots of things that governments need to do, mm -hmm. and and so that's a that's a responsibility um, that that my colleagues take very seriously. After Professor Miller shared with us his ideas on the decline of arts in universities, we asked him what he thought of graduating art students who are struggling with deciding their career paths. Now, I have a, a really personal experience with this, and that's um, a friend of mine who was one of those students who at 18 or 17 made a choice to uh, go to, into a career-oriented program, mm -hmm. finished the career-oriented program, worked for a couple of years and hated it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there was nothing really about the industry that um, matched up with the ideals that he had going into it. Mm -hmm. There was nothing about the industry that he found intellectually um, or creatively satisfying. Mm -hmm. And he went into, um, he went into a, a really rough period. Mm -hmm. um, so a few of us banded together and we did a kind of intervention and we pushed him into a therapist, a therapist's office. And I'm still really glad we did. But the therapist spent about a session and a half with him and said, y you actually don't have a psychological problem. Mm -hmm. You're having an entirely reasonable reaction mm -hmm. to a kind of um, economic and personal insecurity mm -hmm. and uncertainty that is um, pervasive among people that 
uh, are your age. Mm. Um, what you're experiencing now is essentially like what you should be experiencing. Mm. Mm. So this um, this psychologist pushed him into a career counselor, mm -hmm. and the career counselor spent a couple of sessions with him, mm -hmm. and came up with a short list of careers. I think there. I, I'm going to get this wrong, but I think there were you know four or five or something careers on the list. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He'd heard of almost none of them. Mm. Oh. This, this counselor came at him with jobs that he didn't even know existed. Mm -hmm. And they entailed, um, the one he picked entailed going back to school mm -hmm. and learning a lot of new things. Mm -hmm. But he did it, and frankly, he is one of the happiest, most fulfilled people mm -hmm. that I know. And I always think that if he had done... Um, what some of us were pushing him to do, like head down, double down, you'll get your break eventually, you just got to mm -hmm. put up with it, it's mm -hmm. just the industry. If he had listened to us and just kept going with the psychiatrist, for example, and tried to be happier, um, he would be a really unfulfilled 40-year-old. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So I think that was a really valuable conversation that we, ha that we had with Professor Miller, but there was a few concerns that we had that didn't totally get addressed. And one of them is that, you know, he was naming a lot of people that were really successful arts undergraduates. And one thing that kind of got glossed over is that a lot of them are successful, not necessarily directly because of their arts undergraduate degree, but because of things that they did afterwards. And I'm not saying that those things didn't really inform what they did afterwards. But like, for example, all of those uh, people on the Supreme Court's you know, they all may have arts undergraduate degrees, but they also all have professional law degrees. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of ties into the concern that I raised to begin with. You know, all art students, well, a, a large number of art students want to just go to law school because they think that they can't get a job in what their arts are. And, you know, th these these people in high-level positions aren't necessarily directly applying what they learn in university. Um, they're doing other things and sort of like taking a position uh, that – is relative to what they did outside of their arts undergraduate education. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And also, I just want to point out that um, the people that he listed, um, those people are normally graduates of highly, highly competitive universities. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of like worries me too, because um, part of the argument coming from the other side is that, well, yeah, I mean, these CEOs are arts undergrads, but they also came from a really highly competitive, competitive university. And maybe that's what's making them successful um, rather than the fact that they major in arts. And for the, you know, 99% of, you know, students not uh, who are not studying in a competitive university, maybe taking an arts degree isn't really um, a good option for them because it's just you know a really risky path to go down to and what I think is really important to understand is that um, by looking at the examples of um, the people that Professor Miller listed um, some of the people for them to go into highly competitive universities it means that they're already taking ownership of their um, education in the first place it means that they will already on their way to becoming successful. So that's why they were able to gain a spot mm -hmm. at, you know, such uh, universities. And I think that, you know, that shouldn't despair a lot of arts undergrads thinking that, oh my God, I'm not studying at one of those like top 1% universities so my life is over. I, I think that's a positive thing to look at because it means that it's not the name of the university or the degree something that makes you, it's really who yeah. you are in the inside. Um, yeah. I think it's really important for you to take ownership of your education. You know, if you're stressed out about what my degree will do, well, then I think that is a really good good time for students to look at some internship opportunities or maybe uh, part-time job experiences um, and maybe to talk to their career counselors or their mentors, you know, to network. Um, so I think that taking ownership of the university and really for students to, to believe that their degree is useful is really, I think, the key to having a very fulfilled um, career after graduation. Yeah. And like, I think what you're, what you're getting at is that it's less mm -hmm. important what you're studying, where you're studying, but who you are and what you're willing to do. To, to have a successful career. Yep. So like, again, like a lot of the people he named, uh, like the former CEO of Goldman Sachs, like I'm sure that he got to his position just by being like having a voracious appetite for for being successful. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that he uses his undergraduate education to think about what he's going to do moving forward. But at the same time, he wouldn't have been that successful just by going and getting his undergraduate degree. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of work in between. True. And so like what you really got to do is apply yourself. And, and li I like what you're saying about ownership because it's really, it, it's, it's making your life your own rather than letting, mm -hmm. you know, the university dictate what career paths you're going to have on your own because it's not going to do that for you. Yeah, it's really 
mean, I think that just really ties in well with the story that Professor Miller was um, telling of his friend mm -hmm. uh, who had to go and see a career counselor. I, I can highly relate to that. Um, and I think it's just really important for students to embrace the anxiety that they have and yeah. make sure that you have a very healthy approach to it. And if yeah. There, and yeah, and if there's anything that I really got from what he had to say is that I think that Professor Miller really believes that every sort of crisis is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. So you should take that anxiety and have a chip on your shoulder and use that to get yourself into a successful position. Or conversely, um, this sort of market-based view of the university wherein um, the declining numbers will force professors to innovate and that will uh, that will force them to sort of recapture the public mind and get more students to come into it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I'm necessarily as optimistic that um, this innovation is going to attract people. So, for example, he's talking about new interesting classes. Mm -hmm. And I think those classes are great. But I don't know if they're going to attract people that aren't already in arts. I think what they're doing is they're attracting people that are already there. Mm -hmm. And these steady declines that we're seeing do worry me, regardless of how much we innovate. And, mm -hmm. you know, things like advertising may work. And I, and I very well hope they do. And I very mm -hmm. well hope that people sort of remember how much – uh, the humanities and the arts inform things like socioeconomic policy and cultural mm -hmm. policy, which impact our daily lives. Mm -hmm. Like, I think those are really important. But I don't know if these market pressures in and of themselves are going to be what save arts. And I don't mm -hmm. know if arts is dead. And I don't know if it's dying. But it is declining. And yeah. I don't know if the market will save that. I think that, you know, individuals will save that. And I really hope that we do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think that's a really interesting point. I think my question right now is, do you think that you know, part of uh, why you think that might not work may have to do with how mm -hmm. universities sort of like measure what does it mean to be a successful graduate, mm -hmm. you know, because we have this sort of like very, uh, um, sort of like markings like, um, you know, how much do they earn? What yeah. type of job do they have? Yeah. How long did it take for them to get a job? Do yeah. you think that if we were to sort of like change that um, sort of like that barometer, do you think maybe the perception would be, I mean, the engagement would be different with how people might be attracted to arts? Well, for sure. And, yeah. I, and I think like, you know, the numbers leave out so many different things. Yes. So like a lot of the reason why arts undergraduates tend to make less money is because they choose, intentionally choose jobs that pay less. So mm -hmm. for example, you see a huge number of arts undergraduates working at things like nonprofits yep. and NGOs and working in other countries where they they don't need to make as much money mm -hmm. because they're in a place where they you know the the purchasing power parity is is, is way lower. Mm -hmm. um, it, those are things that don't get reflected in the numbers, which are very different. And I think the value of arts isn't necessarily something that is quantifiable. Uh, that's uh, true. That's my 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 general position on the issue. Yeah, I mean, I I kind of my favorite thing about our conversation with Professor Miller is that he really emphasized the sense of fulfillment mm -hmm. um, that he mentioned towards the end. And I think that's something that. You know, students, when they're facing a really, like, complicated decision about, you know, career paths and, you know, what to major, what to study, I feel like they should ask themselves that first question first and work towards, and have other decisions work towards having that sense of fulfillment. So, what's wrong with getting an arts degree? Well, the number one concern that we've identified in this episode, I think, is that there's no guarantee of a job at the end of the tunnel. And there's huge variability in with regards to job success. It's not like going into like an engineering or science degree and, and knowing there's that job attached to whatever you studied when you're done. That being said, there are a lot of really successful arts undergraduates and there's a huge variability in, you know, to what degree they succeed in whatever fields they choose. And I think the number one conclusion that we've drawn here is that uh, whether or not you have career success isn't really a function necessarily of what you studied or where you studied always. It's more a function of whether or not you take ownership of your studies and yourself as a person and you make sure you use all the available resources to get the kind of job that you want when you can. And with that, I would like to kind of just identify a couple of resources that are on campus to help you, which we will expand upon in an upcoming blog hereafter. And there's really two that I want to touch on. The first is the Center for Student Involvement and Careers. Uh, the people over there are lovely and they're amiable and their number one goal is to make sure that you can find uh, internships, jobs, what have you, after you get out of here. So I'd really recommend you take a look at their resources. And the second one is uh, WorkLearn. Lila and I are employed under WorkLearn at, at UBC and a lot of people don't actually know that this is a thing. But WorkLearn jobs are available through the Careers Online function of uh, UBC websites. And there's tons and tons of these jobs, and they pay well, and they work around your schedule. 
And I'd really like to encourage you, if you feel remotely anxious about job prospects or financial insecurity, and you're in any program, let alone arts, to take a look at both of those. And with that, we want to thank you for joining us in this episode of Intuition. And we also like to thank Professor Miller for taking his time to be on, uh, on our episode. Uh, with that, we would like you to keep the conversation going. Um, you can tweet at us at UBC Learn, and you can check out our Instagram page. And if you want to comment anything, you can visit the blog post that Flynn just mentioned. And we'll see you again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mate for here?